Good morning and welcome to this joint hearing of the House Environment and Energy Committee and the Transportation Committee. This morning we are going to continue our conversation about uh, climate <coughs> resilience um, and we're going to shift gears to <coughs> perspective and start hearing from Seth Jensen, the Deputy Director of Lamoille County Planning Commission. Welcome, Mr. Jensen. Um, thank you. Um, to both committees for this opportunity to speak about the July 2023 and now December 2023 floods in Moyle County. Um, I am Seth Jensen. I'm the Deputy Director of the Lamoille County Planning Commission. Uh, I've been working with the Lamoille County Planning Commission since 2011. Um, I began uh, working there about a month after the major spring uh, 2011 floods and was there during the Irene recovery. So flooding along the main stem and the tributary areas of the Lamoille River has been um, a major part of my work and the regional commission's work um, since uh, I, I began um, working there. Uh, I do want to start by stating though that 2023 feels very different. Uh, and I want to begin by highlighting both the severity and the urgency that we currently face. So two of the four largest floods recorded in the Lamoille main stem in Lamoille County have occurred in the last six months. Um, in addition to the physical damages, these floods have highlighted gaps and inadequacies of many of our existing programs and systems. And as often the case, these gaps have the greatest impact on the people and communities with the fewest resources. What we are watching today is the climate crisis and the housing crisis converging into a crisis of equity. Nearly six months after the floodwaters receded, many people and communities are still living every day with the impacts of the floods. People who have been displaced from their homes and are experiencing are at risk of homelessness. People who are living in homes that are damaged without heat, electricity, or water. People who are living in unsafe conditions and unable to relocate because of lack, the lack of safe and affordable housing outside of the floodplain. Those are individual impacts. Um, we have community impacts of communities that still lack vital services like um, post offices, um, a major gap in our region, um, the loss of the downtown grocery store in Johnson, um, resulting in no full service grocery store on the Route 15 corridor anywhere between Jericho and Morristown um, in an area where we have many older residents, uh, many uh, households, um, with single parents, um, and many households without access to an automobile. Um, and then there are also the um, psychological impacts and anxiety that many people still live with um, that we certainly saw exacerbated when just a few weeks ago um, in December we our communities were at risk of flooding again this time not in the summer but in the winter with frigid water. So to understand how we ended up here I'll briefly provide the committee with an uh, a recap of the impacts of the 2023 flood in Lamoille County, which brought near record flood levels to many communities along the main stem of the Lamoille River. In Johnson, the community that was perhaps most heavily impacted, we saw the Lamoille River pour over its banks into neighborhoods on River Road, Railroad Street, Lower Main Street, and the mobile home park on Westcombe Road. As was repeated in community after community, Many of the areas and neighborhoods most impacted are home to low and moderate income households, older and more, more affordable homes, and higher concentrations of rental housing. Johnson also saw its village wastewater treatment plant fully inundated and inoperable for several days. Um, is now back up, up in operations under what the village manager refers to as a Frankenstein plant. Um, the water is clean. Uh, but it's taking a lot to keep the water clean and a lot of effort from um, that small uh, municipal uh, utility. Um, Johnson also saw its municipal office, fire department, and post office flood. Uh, the municipal office is still closed. Uh, the uh, 
operations are being done currently out of the, uh, the Johnson State College campus, which I recognize that is an outdated term and dates me. Um, the Sterling Market, which was the grocery store in downtown, had seven feet of water at its front door. Um, and somewhat unfathomable to understand what seven feet of water looks like in a downtown, um, but it is something we all have to fathom now. Um, in Woolcott, a smaller town, um, further north on the main stem, um, in the middle of the night, debris began collecting under the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail Bridge over the, the main stem on School Street, uh, which is in the heart of Woolcott's village. Um, that debris dam held back the river and sent floodwaters into homes as well as the town garage and fire station areas, by the way, that are outside of the floodplain, according to FEMA's maps. Um, that debris dam broke in the middle of the night and sent a flash flood down School Street that impacted additional homes, including homes not mapped uh, as in the flood hazard area and knocking at least one home off of its foundation. Um, after the floodwaters receded, uh, for days, people continued to struggle with negatively impacted uh, septic systems because of high groundwater, um, which also led to threats to uh, wells throughout the village. We'll cut, like many of our smaller villages, is entirely on on-site wells and on-site septic. Um, and in the village of, in, in the town of Cambridge, in the villages of Jeffersonville and Cambridge Village, we saw the Jeffersonville senior housing evacuated shortly after dawn on July 11, 2023. I'll talk a little bit more about Jeffersonville and the senior housing in a little bit. Um, the evacuation, in a way, um, is a success story. Uh, when we're talking about evacuations and success stories, though, that tells you um, what a major challenge we have. Um, in the village, however, we saw the Lamoille inundate much of the village again, including many homes and businesses that were shown outside of FEMA's map floodplain that included the Cambridge Village Market, uh, which had been purchased by new owner owners only two weeks earlier, um, a business that was not shown as being in the floodplain. It included the uh, Rite Aid Pharmacy. Um, so for a period of time, not only did we not have a supermarket in that gap between Jericho and uh, Morrisville, we did not have a pharmacy. Um, which is a major challenge for um, older residents, uh, people with children, anyone with need for uh, health care access. Thankfully, the Rite Aid uh, has reopened. Um, and then north of the Wrongway Bridge, um, at least 25 people were rescued from the roof of a home um, after the Lamoille had uh, surrounded on all four sides. So that was July. Um, only six months later, on December 18th, the Lamoille flooded again. Um, and while the physical impacts were not as significant um, because the river mercifully crested below the levels at which some of those same areas would have been flooded, um, but only six inches below, by the way. We were very, very close again. Um, it demonstrated again that many of the same communities and people uh, remain at risk. Johnson did experience some flooding in downtown, um, including in the post office again. So that is where we are. Um, and the most important question we can ask now is, is what do we do? Um, so Lamoille County Planning Commission has spent quite a bit of time working with communities along the main stem to understand the flood dynamics better. Um, we've worked with all of the communities that I mentioned to um, model and understand Lamoille River to engage with people on planning for um, the future. Um, that includes both supporting um, emergency response through our Regional Emergency Management Committee, um, planning for uh, preparation and then mitigation. Um, I'm going to speak more about mitigation because it has been my role. Um, I do want to be sure that both committees understand though that regional planning commissions are involved in that preparedness and response uh, as well. Um, so because I recognize that talking about the flood, the floods can be challenging 
Um, I do want to start with a bit of a success story, which I mentioned earlier in Jeffersonville. Um, following 2011, um, the Moyle County Planning Commission was able to work very closely with the village of Jeffersonville and the town of Cambridge to plan mitigation strategies for Jeffersonville. Um, that was based on um, direct partnership with the community. When I say community, I mean, I do include the municipal government, but I also mean broader than that of the people who um, lived through the flood and in that case, the 2011 floods um, and had direct experience. Um, much of what we learned about the river dynamics that were eventually confirmed by um, science uh, were based on um, on the ground observations of people who had um, experienced and been impacted by the floods. In fact, um, we were able to map a secondary channel that was turned out to be based on science, the source of a lot of the flooding in Jeffersonville um, based on the debris and wood piles of, of people who had their um, firewood piles activated in uh, the 2011 storms. Um, because of that, um, the communities were able to access resources to do several major flood mitigation projects to retrofit uh, transportation infrastructure, as well as restore some of the natural functions of floodplains in the village. Um, and those projects likely present, prevented significant damage in the Halloween 2019 storm, um, as well as the December 2023 20, storm. Um, and delayed high water in July 2023, long enough to enable a more orderly evacuation um, at dawn as opposed to the middle of the night. Um, I think we heard from first responders that the mitigation efforts gave people about 45 extra minutes. Um, you hear from emergency responder, responders that seconds count. Um, there's a lot of seconds, 45 minutes. Um, unfortunately, the river reached a height, though, where event those those measures were not capable of mitigating the record storm, um, but they were capable of giving us more time. Um, so an important lesson of that for everyone to keep in mind, our two important lessons is the importance of communities, um, the importance of regional and state leadership, in addition to local engagement, um, and then the fact that the federal resources are structured so they're funneled through local government um, and that many of our smaller governments and um, local governments need support for great management, technical assistance, um, and just um, figuring out how they're going to support the match and maintenance ongoing. Um, Seth, yes. I have to just make sure that you have coordinated with the other presenters in this block of time because yes. we need to stick to our schedule. So I want to be respectful of their testimony as well. This is great testimony, yes. but um, we have a couple other people to hear from in this block. I think that's a good note to turn it over. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that was great timing. Okay, good. No, Amy, um, I'm sure I have a good uh, We have one question here for you. I have one question or comment for, for all three of you, actually. Uh, my concerns here today are your transportation infrastructure within your region. Uh, because my concern is, is the small towns may have uh, received more damage than their total overall town budget for the entire year. And what, if anything, uh, can we do to help you through the process until FEMA kicks in? And, and we just we learned just before the July storm that the state actually signed off on the last project from Irene in 2011. So this is a this could be a gap. That, that concerns me personally, uh, that we, if, if something needs to be done, we'll need to know that. Uh, and because it's just your three regional planning commissions and we have all up and down the spine. So uh, something that we, we, we'd like, to, I would like to look at uh, to see where we're at. And you know, we have a tight agency budget, but you know, if we can do something to relieve some of that crisis, uh, for the for the communities, that would be for me. That would be very important. I'll just ask that question once, or make that comment once. <laughs> yeah. 
Hi, um, I'm Chris Campany. I'm executive director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. Uh, we cover 27 towns in southeast Vermont uh, in Wyndham, uh, Bennington, and Windsor counties. Um, I'm also the chair of the uh, Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies Emergency Planning Committee. Uh, so I'm the primary liaison between the response, disaster response recovery agencies and the RPCs. Um, I also have the lead on issues related to conservation, forests, ecology, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's been an interesting period. Um, and I'm going to address things kind of at a higher level. I'm happy to get, get into the weeds on what happened in our region um, in July. But I'm going to start with municipal road maintenance realities. And so it's because we're, it's a joint meeting, I'm kind of going to talk about the, the natural resources and transportation nexus. So the frequency and severity of both rain and rain, snow, ice, and wind storms has uh, markedly changed maintenance and cost dynamics for towns. Regular maintenance work that would normally occur in summers may not be possible if road crews have to respond to damage done by successive rounds of summer storms or a few major storms. What the state went, all most all the state went through in 2023 in our region when the rest of the state was in drought in 2021, we had massive flooding rivaling in some cases the scale of Irene. And in some cases worse than what we had in 2023 because we had one of those situations where like six inches of rain in an hour and a half. And it wasn't just the rivers. The, actually, it wasn't a river flood situation. This blew out headwaters streams, the tributaries, in a way that most people alive today had never seen before. And this is a new dynamic we're all dealing with. Um, and I'll get into that a bit more later. But that summer, so in 2021 and in 2023, our road crews were basically in constant response mode starting in winter when the ground didn't freeze. So they were basically plowing up the road. And then we had four really disastrous snowstorms, heavy snows, the worst being in March, which is but for most people living memory was our worst um, in terms of power outages. So they were having to cut trees too and, get, and clear the path for utilities. And that's not only expensive and heavy work, that's really dangerous work. Um, and I know of at least one um, road crew that lost their truck well, luckily they weren't in a truck, but a tree fell and crushed the truck. There's an unplanned expense, right? But this is the reality we're dealing with. And we're doing this, I've got 27 towns. Um, the smallest has a population of six, Somerset. Um, largest is Brattleboro with about 13,000. Um, and that means 26 separate highway and 26 separate town garages, at least 26. So we kind of need to revisit, I think, a lot of assumptions we have about how can towns possibly keep up with all this? And um, so one of the things I would encourage you also to think about in terms of the, um, the natural resources and transportation nexus is we need to ensure the Miss Rose General Permit requirements, which were put in place to reduce uh, uh, sediment or, uh, erosion into waters. Um, we need to make sure the requirements are in line with the new road maintenance reality so towns can actually achieve the MRGP goals. This includes compliance timetables, maintenance of improvements under the MRGP, including maintenance of the riprap and the ditches that may become much more quickly embedded with sediment than anticipated, and the support towns will need for updated road erosion inventory. Those are about to come around again. Um, and obviously, as you might guess, you probably would expect a lot of dynamics on the town roads um, have changed. Towns may grumble about the U-shaped ditches and the rip wrapping of ditches and all, but what the road foreman are telling us, at least one-on-one, -on -one, maybe not necessarily in their peer group, is they are helping to actually reduce damage to roads because that they're accommodating the flows and the, the intensity of the flows better than the old-fashioned V-shaped ditches, so you're having less incisement along the roads. Not sure, we'll have to see what the data shows about actual you know reduction in sediment loading but it does seem to be making the roads more resilient um we need to to your point about um what we need we need to ensure that the programs that support municipal transportation especially rural roads align with emerging realities and trends this includes grant programs not only through vtrans but also vermont emergency management and the ages of natural resources um and as towns rebuild after after a disaster, often having the ability to incorporate mitigation measures and repairing or replacing infrastructure, that can then reduce their ability to deal with just other capital improvement needs that have related to transportation if they're in constant response mode, right? 
it's hard to kind of take the time to then do what you need to do. On the, on the disaster recovery front, um, I'm happy to, I'll share after the fact with the committee. I, I did a, a one or two page of lessons learned from Irene. I've updated it. It's aged pretty well. But we need to do constant training with towns on maintaining lines of credit, how to do financing, how to deal with bonds, right? Just because you get elected to a select board does not mean suddenly you are equipped with understanding of how to pass a bond issue or how bonds work or what are your different financing options. How do you save for a rainy day? How do you invest those rainy day funds? And so to my mind, that's something that um, RPCs, the bond bank, GLC, and state agencies, and state treasurer and others can, can work on. Um, and of course, there's so much turnover at the town levels. This, need, this needs to be just a constant uh, training. Um, the reason I was late, I was testifying on the Senate and Rivers bill. How much time? Um, another, another minute or so. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was testifying on the Senate Rivers bill. I think recognize that watersheds don't stop at town boundaries and that river corridor planning and project implementation are inherently intermunicipal in nature. And we need to objectively assess the most efficacious approach which may require more leadership, coordination, and frankly, staffing at the state level, working with regions and towns. Um, honestly, from my perspective, um, our towns generally don't have the capacity to adopt things like flood ha uh, uh, river corridor bylaws. Certainly most towns that have adopted flood hazard bylaws in our region, if you don't have a professional um, uh, zoning administrator, it is really difficult, if not impossible, for them to administer the, NF, the, the flood hazard bylaws, and when you have a disaster, it's more so. Most towns adopt those flood hazard bylaws without really thinking what it takes to administer these things. And that's not only, to my mind, because I've done this in another jurisdiction, actually, you know, been that zoning person. Um, you know, it's not just the permitting and enforcement, it's also the ongoing outreach and education, so people even understand they have to have permits anyway. So, frankly, the concept of transferring that responsibility to the state and then having towns be either be delegated or to opt in if they've got the same protections and the capacity to, to implement the rules will much better protect for monitors. Well, we won't have as much of a patchwork quilt and BLCT and towns individually can 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 speak to uh, for themselves on this. But I imagine a lot of them would probably like to not have that on them. They would like for their residents to still have access to flood insurance, but not have that that responsibility of managing those. Um, Let's see. I already talked a bit about this, but um, you know, the, we had a lot of river flooding. We also had a lot of stream flooding. I would encourage you to take testimony from the state geologist, but also I gave I gave a presentation to the American Society of Civil Engineers Geotech Institute at Norwich University, and the geologist there said basically, we're living in a new geologic epoch that no human alive has, nobody's ever experienced. Things are changing so fast. Um, and I would encourage us, especially, and it's not just in rural towns, but we really do need to take into, we really do need to think about what is happening on these smaller streams and tributaries because they are causing a lot of damage. And as you guys know, uh, especially on the, natural, on the natural resources side of the equation, this isn't just about a buffer along streams. It is the entire dynamic of how forested, how much understory do we have up in the hills, because that's going to buffer the flow. So it's not going to fix it perfectly, but the more impervious surface we have, the more clearing we have, it's going to change that hydro, the hydro, the, the dynamics of the hydrology in those headlands and those, and those, and those uh, headwaters, and that's then going to have further impacts in the lower in the flooding uh, in the lower areas. And the thing I'm seeing too is where you where where the where the streams, especially. Um, come out into the alluvial fans, um, the amount of sediment that is being accreted as the velocity slows down and start dropping their loads, it's going to cause more probably and frequent flooding. You're not going to dig your way out of this. It's really, we need to look more like what are these dynamics and how do we plan on a, on a, on a river corridor level? Um, how, to, how to best mitigate and reduce flood intensity and frequency. Um, and then last but not least, I love to uh, uh, Christian plenty of time. Um, we've really got to look at investing in 
not just a plant, not in how to actually achieve compact settlement. That's the flip side, right, of trying to, you know, you've got, as we try to have safer and more effective compact settlement, you also have to figure out, you know, how do we conserve the lands beyond those compact settlements. But to do that, it's not just bylaws and other policy language. We really need to master plan these priority growth areas so you know what best goes where, especially growing community, growing community away from harm's way. And then what infrastructure do you need? And I'm not talking just water and sewer, it's also sidewalks, lighting, parks, other things. That's the way, you know, just comprehensively plan what is needed to make this happen. And that will also tell us where housing is possible and what conditions are gonna be necessary to have the housing in the numbers of, in the thousands that we need just to accommodate the people who are here now the last but not least, because we've got the transportation folk here, um, where state highways go through compact settlements, they have a profound impact on the livability of these places. And that must be incorporated into the new design standards that VTrans is updating. Um, and it, we've got to quit this policy, I'm sorry I'm being a little strong about this, but I'll stand by it, um, of where towns want to do traffic calming and improving the safety for transit, bike and ped and other uses. Um, that it's an all or nothing approach where the town has to adopt that, that state highway segment as a class one town road. Just enter into a simple agreement that the town will maintain those, those facilities, not have to re, re, be responsible for the fund, full repaving and everything else that has to happen. And it can't be this all or nothing approach. I know that it's not a budget saving measure for the state. It's a livability measure for Vermonters in, this, in the settlement pattern that we say we want. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Christian. Thank you for your testimony. Did you like? Uh, if you don't mind, sure. um, question. I couldn't. First of all, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. Um, I always appreciate your testimony. Uh, we need a master plan, is what you said. Um, any thoughts uh, within your role as an RPC, working with so many towns from six to fifteen thousand? Um, the dynamic between. Uh, you know, town rule and state master plan for Montpelier doesn't really always go so well. How do we have that conversation with individuals via your experience? Yeah, it's working with the planning commissions, but it's, it's giving them the resources they need to be able to do that. I mean, in my, in my perfect world, I would have a landscape architect on staff and we could do that work in house. Um, it's getting hard if hiring a landscape architect or other, um, Design, group of design professionals to do like that conceptual master planning or physical master planning. It's a fairly lengthy process and it's not cheap. Um, but really even just helping towns, even if it's a conceptual plan to like look at how the land lays, look at all the different, uh, you know, the geology, the hydrology, the, the ecosystems, be able to start laying that out physically. So then everybody, you don't just have the same vision in terms of the policy language on a page, like what the words say or what's in the zoning bylaw, then everybody actually has that shared vision. They can visualize what it is they're trying to achieve. So then when you're talking about, okay, then we need to make investments in things like water and wastewater, you can see where it's gonna go, um, what you're going to be able to achieve by making those investments. But hopefully, ideally, it would also inform the state, like budgetarily, where do we need to put money in to make this happen? Um, I've got a proposal one before the UVM uh, Institute for Rural Partnerships to actually map where we do and do not have wastewater capacity. And I'll tell you that what that's going to tell you is where you can have housing and where you can. Um, at a county level, that would be step one. Uh, it's something we've got to have. But that, that's a long answer to your question, but that's that's the way we would do it. I think it's, I'm not saying we have to have somebody on staff. I mean, but that's what we would. It wouldn't be like the state imposing anything, the regions imposing anything. It would be working with the towns to to go through this visioning process and plan out where do you have the the settlement patterns. I will say in our region, if the towns want to do it, I hope they will. I'm going to want to work for like five towns on the housing question, which will also inform like the village development question. Because um, trying to plan housing, especially in rural towns, on a town by town by town basis doesn't make a lot of sense. But having them as a cluster talk about it, then you can identify, okay, that's really where you need to make the investment in the infrastructure. That's really the safest place to have that housing. This is where all these towns benefit from. And here are the opportunities for infill, you know, in all five of them. But to get literally the thousands of units that we need, that takes a lot of planning. Thanks so much for your testimony. Um,
Next, we have Christian Meyer, the director of Central Vermont Regional Planning. Can we relocate the witness? We can't see the person. I know it's tough. It has to do with where the camera is and the live um, stream. Maybe it would go a little bit. I think way. maybe a little bit more this way yeah. would go. You know, this, this, this room. Yeah, that's fine. Be careful of the corner. Yeah, yeah just <laughs> don't unplug anything when you slide us over. Yeah, these are cameras are different from what we have in committee. So still, make first impression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still totally blocked. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the yeah. folks just yeah. at my committee, could you move back a little bit so that folks further in line? The, the setup of the tables is a little bit tricky. Sorry. Well, well, I'll go from the course. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a good view of Patty. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Yeah, not on the camera. Hi, thank you very much, Christian Meyer from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. We're here in Montpelier. We represent 23 towns in Washington County, plus the towns of Orange, Washington, Williamstown, and Orange County. Um, Chris's testimony was excellent. I think covered on all those big high level items that uh, we care about as well. Obviously, uh, Seth did an extremely good job of outlining the severity of this question and how we got here and why we're all trying to figure out how we're adapting. I'm going to play off Chris, the themes Chris outlined and kind of point to some examples of where we're having success in Central Vermont and what we've been working on even uh, prior to July to help towns get ready for these types of events and hopefully have them suffer smaller mitigated impacts uh, as they continue to come. Uh, first, Chris was talking about the road situation, municipal roads. Uh, had uh, success working with the town of um, kind of plain field where they had a repeat damage bridge on Brook Road. Uh, it washed out in 2011, 2015. Um, the problem was is the bridge was in really good shape. Uh, is the road around that kept washing out. So under a traditional uh, asset management plan, it wasn't qualifying for replacement or expansion to full bank width. Um, we were able to support the town's initiative to create an application for uh, FEMA funding under the BRIC program, where the primary consideration was exactly that the resilience and capacity of the bridge to handle the floodwaters or the high waters during the severe rain events uh, on the Great Brook. They were successful in their application, will ultimately take on the administration role during the construction phase to give the town that capacity. Um, but it, I think it's a really good example of how towns need more sources like that from the BRIC program to, to address their infrastructure shortfalls. Um, that are not necessarily based on a, a traditional asset management plan, uh, which is obviously extremely important. Um, another area the RPCs have been, I think, beneficial and uh, gathered data that is making positive impacts. And I think we can leverage it further going forward is the bridge and culvert inventory that's conducted throughout the state on a regular basis. Uh, this is an inventory of all principles and primary assets on the roads. Um, it's an opportunity to see where they're right sized, where we need greater capacity, where they're clogged and need maintenance. Um, so that when these uh, flash rain events come, you don't end up getting a block culvert that washes out the road. Uh, further after that disaster, you have that data from before the event that you can, you can look at when you're making your reporting uh, to ensure that uh, you can just, you know what was in the road before it got washed out, essentially. Um, one area where we don't have a solution, but it is an area of growing concern, is gravel. Uh, our towns are really worried about where the gravel is going to come from. Uh, the town dips are getting low. Um, and uh, if we're going to have repeat washouts like we had in the last six months, this is a big question for that. And I, I don't have an answer. I don't have a strategy that's working, but I just want to make sure I mention it. Um, in, in terms of how we build the roads, we've mentioned uh, tweaking our, the municipal roads grant pro, or general permit to better fit the realities of the environment, and that's absolutely fundamental. Expanding the uh, better roads program, where we focus really on upsizing and not just water quality, but capacity, I think would be a, a key step to help us with our making sure our back roads and our, our, our gravel roads are, are better hardened for these events. Um, we are, we are, we've also talked about river corridors and uh, stormwater flow. Um, a couple of projects we've been involved in that have been uh, that, have, that, have, that have stood up to these past storms are some best management practices 
uh, implementation projects in central Vermont, uh, two most recently, one in Plainfield, uh, one is wrapping up in, in Moortown. Um, I, our final site inspection was on July 15th this summer for the Plainfield project, and you can build projects to withstand these storm events, cut back on erosion, and, um, and, and, and reduce the amount of sediment flowing into the river. Uh, here, right, generally speaking, a small actor in this field. We do, we do, we do a couple projects every year. Uh, there's a lot of other folks out there, but I think what we can do as a RBC is kind of bring, bring, bring some uh, equality of opportunity to the municipalities, not just based on the opportunity or a energetic uh, planning commission. We can be there with that institutional knowledge and make sure that all our municipalities um, are getting invited to these programs. Um, I think similarly, uh, well, I can roll on to the next one. Uh, Chris also brought up compact, compact development. I think you can look at Central Vermont and be pretty hard pressed to find one village that isn't bifurcated by a state road. Uh, if you don't design for a human scale, mm -hmm. I don't know how we get people to move into uh, these places. Um, our house plot, they're, they're planning for sidewalks, they're building sidewalks. Um, when we're, and it's, it's not just the larger municipalities, it's uh, little little villages um, like Orange in the process of designing sidewalks right now, trying to figure out how to create a safe place for your students to walk and access the elementary school in the village uh, with Route 302 plowing right through the middle town. So we need to find a balance there. Um, towns are, when they get the chance, planning for more dense and compact development. Um, as part of really looking at how we help the city vary, maintain its housing stock, we're kind of working on an infield study that hopefully can be used to uh, energize uh, developers to maybe take advantage of um, existing opportunities that are there. Uh, this is uh, who was pressed through the, their housing committee and the city at the RPC jump in and offer them some of this technical assistance on the spot. Um, and the takeaway here is that all the municipalities, at least from my perspective, all the municipalities are taking on these projects in different manners um, and using different techniques. Um, the one consistency is that the regional planning committees, or commissions, excuse me, um, can be there to offer that technical assistance and a little wind in their sail um, when they don't necessarily have a, have a Steady, steady committees or volunteer base at a given time, or during changeover, to be another example. That's all I have for you today. That's great. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Representative Smith has a question for you. I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, will the state say that communities between Derby and Newport, uh, I believe it's state road, will the state design sidewalks or does the communities have to put their money forth and find a designer? A state for an engineer. design sidewalks. I, it's almost always the case that it's a municipal initiative. That it is. They'll fund the design process and the implementation process as well. So there, there are probably grants that would be available. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. There's both the pedestrian grant, by the pedestrian grant, and the transportation alternatives grant. Very both fund that work. And I'd want to out. Thank you for that. Yeah. Briefly. That is really expensive money for towns to use. It sure is. So if it's if it's easier for the state to, I mean, for, honestly, I think that's part of a conversation we just need to have is having the towns fully engaged, but where it makes sense, you've already got professionals, engineers, others at the state level. Can we do things more efficiently as opposed to, you know, you've heard me say this before, probably the Hunger Games approach to the towns with the most capacity being able to chase the grants and manage them. RPCs often don't manage the grants, but that is incredibly expensive money for towns to use. And the delays that we're seeing at the historical review and other things, it's driving up the cost by yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars for very simple projects. We've seen in a lot since the Walmart store got built seven, eight years ago in Derby, we've seen a lot of foot traffic going from Derby down to the store and from Newport up. So we've talked a little bit about sidewalks, but it's an expensive venture, I'm sure. And I'll just say a number of towns won't even consider these improvements because of that whole class one town mm -hmm. road adoption, taking that over from the state. A number of towns that we've talked to, once they hear that that's, a, that's probably what they're going to have to do to do the things they want and need to do, it just stops the conversation right there. And yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, can you be brief, Representative Pat? We really are running out of time. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, my my district, five towns in my district, are in fact served by two of the regional planning commissions we, we, we've heard from today. Um, uh, my, uh, my 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 question has to do, or, or and it's also a comment. Maybe it can't all be uh, addressed today. But uh, for instance, I, I have probably two, two, three years ago in a, in a previous committee I was on for testimony about some of the mitigation plans in terms of uh, uh, property acquisition for dealing with overflow uh, in Lamoille County. Um, and uh, and you mentioned the Brook Road in Plainfield. Before I moved to Worcester, I was on the select board in Plainfield for uh, for six years dealing with the Brook Road <laughs> uh, and, and flooding at, in, the, in the late 1980s. Um, uh, my question, particularly for smaller towns, uh, is very, as clearly critical that the RPCs and other uh, broader entities be, be involved. But is there, uh, there are going to be some towns that are that, where the, the uh, select board and others are jumping right in uh, to do this, and others where, for whatever reason, capacity, interest, or whatever, um, uh, it, it's not happening. And also, uh, the, the kind of uh, flood mitigation of dealing with with having a, a capacity to deal with excess flow may occur. The, the, the land may be in one town, but what it affects is the next town downstream. Um, so those those are the kind of questions that I, I know we don't have time to answer all of that. I'm really concerned about the um, uh, whether this is primarily going to happen where the, the people and the local governments really want it to happen and, and not so much in the next town over. Could I briefly just address a piece of that? Um, so every mitigation project in the Moyle County since 2011 has had the RPC involved in some ways, either in drafting the application with the, in partnership with the community or once the application is awarded, assisting the community with um, management and, and permit acquisition and, and those kinds of things. Um, FEMA has become increasingly challenging related to funding management costs. Um, and if that trend continues, the type of work in, that we did in Jeffersonville that we're now trying to do in Wilkin and, and Johnson, um, Communities of that scale will not be able to undertake those projects unless there's another resource to backfill the, um, the just the work that has to happen for a project to go on. Um, <coughs> elevation project that started in Jeffersonville took eight years to complete. Um, we just closed out the FEMA grant for some of the major Irene projects. So. Um, you know, a small town managed by volunteers can't do that without staff support. Um, after Irene, FEMA was very good at funding that management cost uh, piece. Um, it's increasingly challenging, and that is a gap. Um, either make sure, you know, get on FEMA to continue funding those or find another source um, because it just, the small town simply can't do it without support. So thank you all for your testimony. It's super helpful. And um, I guess I would say that, you know, a lot of there's a lot of resilience bills that have been introduced and many of them are moving in the same direction and that we are working to coordinate and bring them to the appropriate committees. And I feel like you really teed that up well for us to understand supporting our small towns um, in addressing the changed environment that we're dealing with. Okay. And I just want to say for our committee, I know I, 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 this was really helpful from all of you. You gave us some really concrete things that we can work on. And I, I look forward to having you back in our committee to kind of drill down on a few of those things. So thank you so much. All right, with that, we are going to take a, a four minute break um, and then try and get back on schedules. We'll transition to the next witness. We are, we are reconvening our meeting of the House Environment and Energy Committee and the Transportation Committee. And we're going to welcome Benjamin Doyle, Chair of Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. Welcome, Mr. Doyle. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation to speak. Thank you. Um, I was actually, I think, going to 
I'm kind of wearing a little bit of two hats here, and so I might just talk about my professional work a little bit, and then specifically how it relates to work in Montpelier. So, uh, as I said, my name is Ben Doyle. I'm the president of the Preservation Trust of Vermont, which is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to build community through the preservation of historic buildings, villages, and downtowns. Um, and, you know, that work looks a lot of different ways. It could be helping a community think, rethink how they use their town hall. It could be like preserving a diner in their downtown, helping a homeowner preserve a historic barn. This, uh, in 2023, we worked on 264 projects in 152 communities. Um, I, I like to boil it down to we help people save the places and spaces that they love. And that uh, on a community preservation or revitalization project, we're often a small town's first and longest friend because some of these projects literally take 10, 15 years, um, but we, st we stick with them. Um, and so when the flooding occurred uh, this summer, that really um, impacted our work, obviously. We, a lot of the communities that we were working in or work, have worked with in the past were impacted. You know, I'm just thinking of things like the old labor ball in Barrie uh, or the library in Johnson, you know, these projects that we've been involved in for years that were like severely impacted. And, you know, we're on the phone with them that day being like, what's going on? What do you need? Um, we really took two different tracks in our approach to response to flood. We have a fantastic field service team that's out in the field all day working with communities, thinking about how you preserve these historic assets. They immediately kind of just started calling people and visiting different communities or buildings that had been impacted with partners like, you know, engineers, structural engineers, um, people like Stevenson Associates or Engineering Ventures to be like, what, what was, not just what was the impact on this building, but what are flood mitigation techniques for the future for this building? And, you know, those are services that we provide year, year round, um, but we really, have, this year we've made a goal to double the number of assessments that we do up to 100 and to waive it's typically a matching grant and we're waiving that for flood impacted communities so that work is kind of ongoing and then the second thing that we did and it's really nice to see particularly seth here today um was in the weeks after the flood the regional planning commissions got together to put together a list maybe you already know this of the communities that were impacted the 18 communities and um, at Preservation Trust, we often work collaboratively with another uh, number of other community economic development partners. And so we just convened a group and said, we're going to every, you know, couple of days, we're going to be at the partner ride in Montpelier and whoever wants to go, we're going to go visit these communities in this order and working with people like Seth to identify, you know, okay, where are the communities that we should really be talking to? Who should we be talking to? So that's groups of people like from USDA Rural Development, where I used to work, Agency of Commerce, Community Development, Community Foundation, the Arts Council, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, Vermont Council on Rural Development. We visited all 18 towns and, you know, we visit various projects or impacted um, areas in, in those communities. And that was uh, a really eye-opening experience, and yet at the same time, it confirmed um, what I think of as the two central truths of community and economic development, at least as I know it. And the first central truth is that if you've seen one small town, you have seen one small town. <laughs> and then the second thing that I believe, uh, and this was confirmed by these visits, was that transformational change takes visionary collaborative leadership. And that, I believe, is the difference between rural communities that are successful and those that continue to struggle. And so some of the very specific examples I saw on these kinds of field sites visits, you know, you could go to different communities and just see widely different responses to the flood or widely different understandings of what was even happening to their community. So, for example, I walked around uh, the north and with the very city manager who had really only been there for a year. He knew every single person we encountered on the street. He knew all the businesses that were impacted. He knew the geography, topography of that place. Uh, if I said, well, how many, uh, how many houses were impacted? He could rattle off the number, but then say, well, that, you know, this many houses, but this many units, just an incredible understanding of what was happening. There are other communities that I visited where you would sit with a town administrator in a small town and you'd say, you know, how many people were impacted by this? And they'd say, geez, you know, we're really responsible for the roads. Right. Really don't know how many houses or, or communities where we knew there were businesses that were impacted during Irene that had been flooded again. And that there's still, you know, it really came down to, and this is not a knock on them. It's, a, it's just a reality of the capacity and frankly, an understanding of what a municipal role is. And, you know, I just point that out that there's just this enormous difference. Um, and, 
you know, uh, just speaking about places that other places that were really successful, even if there are different opinions about what the role of municipal government is, one of the things that we encountered, particularly in the Northeast Kingdom, was every community went to a Barton or Glover or Hardwick that had been impacted. Be like, well, who was helping? Who was doing this? What, you know? And it was Northeast Kingdom organizing. We heard that over and over and over again, that these mutual aid groups that were again, a lot of them like grew up during COVID, um, but that were a, a, a resource for the community members that was extremely important. And when you look, I think an example like Hardwick is really great. They have um, the Civic Standard Group, which is a, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's a community building nonprofit organization. They just do really fun things to build community. But in this moment, they were able to pivot to really help their neighbors. But they work so closely with the municipality. Like Opie, the town manager, they're they're like thick as thieves. And they, they finish each other's sentences. And there's just really an incredible example of collaboration. So with that, meaning the big idea that I'm trying to say is that it really the impact is different in all of these communities and, and that the response is really dependent upon the level of collaboration and vision uh, in these municipalities. I'd like to just kind of shift to Montpelier. I live like 200 yards that way. And um, on the day of the flood, the thing I remember most is just like the smell of a diesel fuel that was just this whole area and inundated with diesel fuel. Uh, the noise, all the alarms of the Capitol complex, like seemingly for days going on. Um, it was just, it was really tough. And I think for a lot of people, it felt <clears throat> like existential, right? That there were people being like, well, Montpelier is no longer going to be Montpelier, or we're going to move Montpelier up to the hills, or, you know, the world has completely changed and this town is no longer viable. It really, it kind of felt that way. And I think we saw an incredible community response, teenagers mucking out basements, um, just incredible work. Um, a lot of people just diving, diving right in. Um, but it was really, this municipality did, I think, a, a remarkable job doing what they did well in terms of continuance of operation and emergency measures and those kinds of things. But when it came to the individual business of what do I do? Who's FEMA? What's an SBA loan? What do I keep? What do I throw away? That really came down to like volunteers and ultimately uh, the downtown organization. Katie Trouts is the executive director of Montpelier Alive. That is not in her job description, but she stepped up and did it. And then um, in terms of like resources available to businesses that were impacted, you know, we had over like 100 businesses impacted in Montpelier. Um, there was a real incredible response of people who just love you know, who love this town. I, I serve on the board of the Montpelier Foundation and in partnership with the Montpelier Foundation and Montpelier Alive, we started the Montpelier Strong Fund, which was just, you know, people wanted to give and support businesses. And, um, you know, we were able to raise over $2 million um, this summer to help support small businesses. That meant that like one week after the flight, we were able to provide thousand dollar checks to every single business to ask for one. And we didn't ask them what they were doing with it. We didn't ask them how they were going to use it. It was just like, here's a thousand dollars, make your payroll, buy your staff lunch, buy cleaning supplies, do whatever you want. Um, and then after that, we had um, basically a, another round of grant um, funding that was just flexible and allowed people to do what they needed to do. Um, you know, I would say that Montpelier is a very well-resourced community. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. The fact that we were able to raise $2 million when you go to a community, you know, like Johnson, it, 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 there's a stark contrast there. And yet I would also say like the impact of our, our downtown businesses was in the tens of millions, tens of millions, right? I, I personally feel like in the week after the flood, I felt like this set us back like a decade. That's what it felt like. Um, so in response to these kind of like really tough moments, but this incredible community energy, um, Paul Costello, who I think many of you might know as the former director of my council on rural development, just did what Paul does. And he really brought the community together through a series of community forums um, where we had three different community forums. The first was really, frankly, an opportunity for people to grieve and express how their emotion and what their experience was. But then it was also an opportunity to identify, okay, well, what are the priorities of this community moving forward? Who do we wanna be? How are we gonna respond? What's this, going, this moment of transformation gonna look like? So those series of forums had over a thousand people participate in them on person or online. I've, I've worked with Paul a lot. I've probably been on 25 PCRD community visits. I've never seen one as well intended or as intense as this one. 
Um, it was really incredible. And um, some of the things that were prioritized by the community, it's a long list of 20 different things, um, but there were things like making our downtown much more adaptive, recognizing it is definitely going to flood again. How do we deal with that? Um, two, recognizing that this is not a Montpelier alone problem. Everybody understands that. It's a watershed-wide issue, that this is a watershed issue that we need to be collaborative. Uh, we need to improve our response so that, like, if, if Katie's job is to help the business to survive, she needs to know that before it happens and <laughs> have the resources to do it. Uh, and then the, the other thing that was identified was that you know, our city, our city council, our city manager, our mayor, it's an overwhelming moment. The budget is a complete disaster. Uh, and they don't, frankly, have a lot of time in this moment in this kind of crisis to be thinking long term. What does Montpelier look like in 50 years? And what are we? So the community prioritized this idea of an outside commission, uh, folks that have experience in relevant areas, the connections to Montpelier that can really take the time and space to engage the Montpelier community and look for opportunities to build resiliency and to help the community recover. And so that commission was convened by the Montpelier Alive, the city and the Montpelier Foundation. It consists of about 15 people from, you know, it's a uh, it's an, really frankly an incredible group. People applied to serve on it and based upon their skill sets and, and areas of expertise. So we have <coughs> folks that are, you know, architects, um, preservationists, um, we have state flood uh, playing expert, uh, hazard mitigation folks, um, Peter Walk from Efficiency Vermont, Allie Richards from Let's Grow Kids, folks that have a lot of community and economic development experience <coughs> and um, really love this town. And, you know, uh, and I'm on it, I chair it. Uh, first, you know, first prize is being on the commission, second prize is cheering. And, um, <laughs> We really view our work as looking for opportunities that to get projects unstuck. You know, Montpelier is a town that loves to plan, and there are 20 years worth of plans about how to make the city more resilient. Um, and what we're really looking forward to is surfacing those opportunities, building the collaborative visionary partnerships that are needed, and then just relentlessly and optimistically bird dogging them to see good things happen. And um, I'm gonna give you two specific examples of the kinds of things that we're working on. It has now been 179 days since Montpelier has had a post office. It's just totally unacceptable. You know, this state capital at 179 days, we have not had a post office. Um, so we have been trying to engage with postal leadership. Uh, we've been working very closely with our congressional delegation, informing the community, providing opportunities for the community to reach out directly to postal leadership to express their feelings, trying to support the postal workers who are actually doing a fantastic job. It's the, it's the regional leadership. Um, on Monday, we organized a, a rally with the entire congressional delegation. It'll be 1230 in front of the post office. You're all invited. Um, and we're just gonna kind of continue to put pressure. I really, we all believe that community voice matters and that it makes a difference. And so that's one example. Another one that I think is really concrete is uh, relates to the watershed issue. And um, Montpelier is a small place and there are actually very few floodplain, available floodplain opportunities for restoration that could potentially help mitigate future flood. But there are some. And um, I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole, I promise, but like there's a property down by Agway called Five Home Farm Way. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's an old farmhouse. It's a very long and complicated story, but essentially over a decade ago, a nonprofit owned it. They went out of business for whatever reason, did not dispose of the asset. The Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has a conservation easement on the land. The Preservation Trust has a historic preservation easement on it. There's a mortgage from the Vermont Community Loan Fund. Nobody really owns it because the entity was dissolved by the Attorney General's office. So it's been in this legal morass for 10 years and nothing has happened. And it really, as a result of the relationships formed at this commission, we identified a path forward for that property. Uh, and we were able to, uh, um, working collaboratively, it, um, put in an application to Vermont Emergency Management for the Flood Resilient Communities Program, uh, and we received funding to um, resolve the ownership issue, purchase the property, take down the house where there was recently a shooting, um, and, uh, and begin the pre-engineering of restoring 18 acres of floodplain just outside the city, or just inside the city of Montpelier. That is not gonna make the difference. That's not gonna, you know, bring the water down a foot in Montpelier in the next flood. But it's a start. And when you start aggregating projects like that along the watershed, it really does start to make a difference. 
Um, you know, I think what I would like to just really emphasize is that um, I think the state of Vermont has an enormous opportunity to lead here, right? That these small towns, whether it were well-resourced big towns like Montpelier, we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it alone. You know, we have an uh, opportunity and a vision to turn back towards the river, right? That we can do this. We can find a way to live with the river. It's hard to do it when 40% of the asphalt in this town is controlled by the state and we have nothing to do with it. Right? We've had wonderful conversations with buildings and general services. We're thrilled by the leadership of, of Doug Farnham, Pat Moulton. It's, we've got these great collaborative partners. What we need is the uh, folks to think creatively, collaboratively, and to give us the tools, many of which already exist, like the resilient community programs or the tax credit program for flood resiliency. There are tools there, but it's gonna take really creativity and you know, um, Montpelier really wants to, this commission, we're really excited to be a part of that watershed-wide conversation to think with Cabot about, you know, how do we work together to solve this mutual problem? But it needs folks like the regional planning commissions and, and folks like Doug and statewide entities to help convene that conversation and, and we're ready to engage. The last thing I just really need to say is that the commission that I serve on uh, is really focused on like infrastructure, visioning, future, you know, big picture, 30,000 foot kind of stuff. But the truth is, if you go like a quarter of a mile down the road here, there are people whose homes were really completely destroyed. You know, I have visited homes there where, you know, there's no sheetrock and they're cooking on a gas grill and it's cold. And, um, you know, part of the work of the commission is we're trying to help stand up a long-term recovery group that can help on individual assistance in that way. But I think even as well-resourced as a town like Montpelier is, there are folks that are really hurting, individuals who need help and to navigate SBA, FEMA, all of it is traumatic. Uh, and a lot of them are, are giving up. And so they really need uh, as much help as we can get. And I would just say the final thing related to that is that this is a transformational moment for Vermont. And it's not just transformational, but like how do we deal with water, but it's how do we deal with equity, right? That how do we make sure that everybody equitably recovers from this crisis and how do we build this <laughs> um, to make us stronger the next time this happens. But I just really thank you for your work and your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'm going to ask one question. I am curious, and I had this uh, same question, I think, for Seth. How many people are currently still um, displaced and struggling from this, in Montpelier? About 450 people applied for FEMA assistance in Montpelier. Well, let me just back up and I will answer that question. You know, I think, and this is just like a full transparency in a moment. Like when the flooding happened and we said, let's get together and form this Montpelier Strong Fund. It, it, to, it, to be honest, it was like existential. Our downtown is going to die. We have to save these businesses, you know. And I think the prevailing narrative was that Montpelier's business district was really impacted and Barry's residential area was impacted and the businesses were fine. It's way more complicated than that. And it's messier than that. And the truth is, yes, our businesses were devastated. But 400 individuals or families applied for FEMA assistance. I think like 230 or something got approved for FEMA assistance. <clears throat> um, but the truth is, and I, I, I think Sue Minter's on your agenda. Mm -hmm. She'll have great information on this. Okay. But the truth is, we really don't know. You know, there were people that didn't apply for FEMA assistance, got rejected from FEMA assistance, that have given up. Um, you know, how many people are actually displaced? I, I, Sue might have a better answer, but I can't say other than that we do definitely know there are people who are really hurting and really don't know how they're going to recover. And if you don't mind, I, do you have an answer in your area? Well, I, I'll say the answer is equally hazy. Yeah. Um, you know, we do know that um, there are people emerging who were not looking for help until it became cold. Um, mm. They were doing the Vermont thing of, you know, making do as long as they could. Um, and there have been um, 
there were quite a few applications for public assistance. A lot of those applications were um, denied or only partially um, funded. And there's some really big challenges with folks who are renters, folks in mobile parks where there's kind of a, you know, ownership of the unit, but not ownership of land um, that makes tracking those numbers really, really hard. So what we do know is that the Lamoille County food shelf is running out of food, um, that the human service providers are reporting people who, you know, were impacted by the floods um, showing up more and more every day. Um, I'll say as the Regional Planning Commission, um, we are assisting people with navigating the buyout process and constantly hearing that the 18 month time frame, which is the minimum if everything goes well for a FEMA buyout to work, um, is too long um, and that they do not have the resources to survive those 18 months in some cases. Um, and I have this property owner permission to share this. The river is three feet away from their foundation and moving closer every day. And 18 months is too long, 18 days is too long. If it's you and your family and your child, three feet away um, from a river that is wildly moving to your home. Um, so I wish I had better numbers and not just anecdotes, but one person, one Vermonter living in that situation is too many. Yeah, can I have one quick thing? So I serve on the Individual and Family Needs Recovery Task Force, um, which is the entity so that Agency of Human Services set up to respond to individual assistance disasters, whether federally declared or not. And there's now a separate long-term recovery group task force, um, which which is composed of these these localized long-term recovery groups are gonna do the, the frankly years worth of work to get people permanently back into housing. Um, so I would encourage Jason Gosselin is the point person with agency. So this is actually an agency of human services. Um, but this is a big conversation. <clears throat> We're gonna have more of these disasters. If it wasn't for FEMA, if it wasn't for this being a federally declared individual assistance disaster, we'd be in really, really bad shape. And it's a really high threshold to meet. We should we need to plan for a lot more of these that are below that threshold where FEMA won't even be in town. It's all on the line. But happy to provide further testimony on that. I've been in these conversations for years. But the challenge we're gonna face is all these renters, as you have the buyouts, yeah, a lot of people aren't gonna be able to do buyouts because they don't they can't there's no other housing to go to. You're gonna have landlords who take buyouts and there's still no place for the renters to go to. And then you're gonna have the people who bring the buildings back into compliance with national flood insurance program standards, they're gonna to have to raise the rents. And so we're probably gonna lose, I'm, this is a guesstimate, this, but this is just based on experience in other places, other disasters. The state of Vermont's probably gonna lose, lose hundreds of Vermonters because there will be no place for them to live permanently. And it's something that we really need to reckon with. Sue's gonna have a, has more intimate in, insight into this, but it's something that we need to prepare for, not just for this one, but what's gonna keep coming. Because in our region, we've, this has happened again and again and again. All right, further questions for Mr. Doyle? Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. <laughs> Can I so in Bennington County, we worked really hard to get the number up high enough to get FEMA. We didn't get there, and so the people, so we got no relief, even though people really got in some instances. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, welcome, Sue Minter. Um, Sue Minter is the executive director of Capstone Community Action and joining us via Zoom. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. We can. Great. Well, I want to just say good morning and thank you so much. Thank you for first allowing me to testify remotely and inviting me to come before your committees on this important topic. For the record, I am Sue Minter, uh, Executive Director of Capstone Community Action. We are a community-based, nonprofit, anti-poverty organization, which was established in 1965, and we serve Washington County, Lamoille, <clears throat> and Orange Counties. And Capstone is one of five community action agencies in Vermont that make up what we call the Vermont Community Action Partnership, VCAP, 
And collectively, our mission is really to end poverty by providing services to people in crisis, whether it's food, housing, or heat through the winter, but also providing tools and opportunities to help lift people out of poverty and into economic self-sufficiency. I've provided um, some resources to explain more about what we do in my testimony for you to look at later. I also want to say for the purpose of this testimony that it is relevant that I served as Vermont's Irene Recovery Officer in 2011. Uh, I also served as Vermont's Secretary of Transportation starting in 2013. And during my tenure, I had the chance to lead a Vermont recovery team to support the state of Colorado after their historic floods of 2013. And I also served on a national White House task force, Obama White House task force on climate preparedness and resilience. And I think these experiences all strongly influence um, my understanding of the urgent need for planning, for investment and action to address these impacts of today in light of our changing climate. Um, like uh, Chris, I've been on the Individual and Family Needs Recovery Task Force, the Housing Recovery Task Force, um, and supporting the long-term recovery. So I can speak to those issues soon. Um, I have to assume you've been hearing testimony about the flooding impacts, uh, about where the rivers meet the roads and our infrastructure. And you know, from Irene, we know a lasting effect on the transportation and river engineering and planning in Vermont. You know, our overall mission after Irene was to, quote, build back stronger and to try to recover with resilience to those threats that we knew were posed by what we predict to be frequent extreme flooding due to our changing climate. And what we've seen over this decade is really that sort of previous foes became colleagues in this quest to think differently about our future and to fully grasp our need to let nature take its course. So since this time, we've built larger bridges and culverts, smarter roads and ditches, and we've really tried to work to allow rivers to meander and give adequate room to flood. And I think there are many important examples of where our resilient recovery in the infrastructure from Irene has had significant positive impact on protecting roads, businesses, homes, and even communities from extreme damage this summer. But obviously, we have not done nearly enough. And given the devastation and destruction of July's flood, we need to dig deeper, to continue to be innovative, to expand our investment and commitment to continuing to recover with even greater resilience and greater understanding of resilience. So today, while you know my previous experience and focus has been on transportation and ecosystem resilience, today I'm gonna to focus on people and the resilient recovery needed for our communities and our economy. And I think it's appropriate, uh, given my current role, that my testimony focused on the most vulnerable. Sue, yes. just a minute. Um, for some reason, your sound just went down. Uh, can you hear me now if I... Speak That's louder. better, I think, but I wonder if we can turn it up. Yeah, I think maybe you, maybe you just leaned back or something. I don't know what happened, but you got very quiet. Not like me to be quiet. Can you hear me now? <laughs> That's better. I'm putting, I'm putting my volume up, but I think that just means you're loud. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's better. I think we did too. Okay. So... You know, I think that what's important is to realize that Vermonters of low income, those who are elderly or living with disability, are really a subset of the larger community, but they're often not seen or overlooked. But we have to realize that it is actually the most vulnerable in Vermont and elsewhere who face disproportionate risk from climate disaster. We've seen in July that these have been the hardest hit in our disaster and who are now facing the greatest barriers to recovery as we were just discussing. And I believe strongly that the needs of the most vulnerable must be front and center in how we recover and plan for a resilient future. Capstone's work uh, on flood recovery, like you've heard, um, really began the day after the July flood. Um, 
it's always refreshing to hear from Ben about community responses across the state. We participated in many in our service area, and we were really one of those many nonprofits on the ground pivoting to respond to the crisis of the moment. Uh, in spite of the fact that our Barry headquarters was flooded out, uh, our team immediately showed up. We went into response mode and provided emergency food, prepared meals, water, baby formula, volunteers. Um, we had brigades going uh, throughout our communities for weeks, um, mucking out homes, you know, providing the kind of support you've heard about. But also throughout our summer, our frontline staff both helped support the state recovery centers, but help people navigate through the complexity of FEMA or SBA, registering for 211, and all of the myriad needs of, of housing and basic supply. We also um, helped step up and lead what was called the Main Street Flood Recovery Fund, another really business relief fund. Uh, we, st we stood this up right in the week after the disaster, raised over $800,000 uh, with a broad uh, group of people across the state, but Capstone helped receive and administer the funds. Are you hearing me okay? Yep, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, and also, we were able to provide support for something called VERT, the Vermont Energy Recovery Team, which hopefully you've heard about. Uh, we received and administered philanthropic funds to help utilities be on the ground addressing those in mo with most acute needs um, for getting their heat repaired. Um, we can touch on that later if you would like. Um, but I think what's relevant for our conversation that we were just having is we have also agreed to work with the state to stand up a FEMA program called Disaster Case Management. And this focuses on individual assistance for long-term recovery, really doing that intensive one-on-one -on -one case management. We're going to be collaborating with community action partners across the state, uh, partnering with the state, but this is under a FEMA program with specific guidelines. Um, we just this week uh, hired our first five of an eventual team of 15 people that will be uh, spanning out across the state to help uh, individuals. I want to also mention the importance of philanthropy, because due to an outpouring of philanthropic support following the floods, it's really enabled Capstone to continue even now to provide what we call mini grants to low income flood survivors for a myriad of like essential urgent needs. And these are things like storage units, paying for storage units, paying for mold assessments and remediation, basic plumbing services, electricians, electric bills, propane contractors, generators, septic systems, gift cards, gas cards, food, clothing, and transportation services. And since the transportation committee is here, you won't be surprised that I want to highlight this most basic need. How do you get where you need to go in an emergency? or after a disaster when you do not have a car. And our existing transit system, which as you know, I'm a strong proponent of, is inadequate for this. Thankfully, um, as I think you may recall, we described last year, Capstone incubated a new, what we call micro transit pilot program called Community Rides Vermont. Uh, we actually launched last spring and have been providing on-demand transportation in all electric vehicles with paid drivers in Washington County. So this service has been a critical resource during and after the disaster. And to this day, we, you know, we helped people evacuate and get to shelter. We are continuing to help people move their things into storage. We take people to work, to the doctor. We transport children to school and to childcare, essential needs. And I hope that the kinds of needs that we are providing helps uh, depict the, that, because it, it's not always obvious uh, for people um, with privilege who have resources that generally are available to meet the most urgent and pressing needs in a disaster, but for people without resources, they cannot. So I wanna really emphasize that without immediate assistance, many people are quickly slipping from a state of living on the edge of stability and into a state of extreme poverty. And that's where we are today. More and more Vermonters are slipping into a state of an extreme 
poverty. And just to exemplify this fact, I'm going to share with you a brief snapshot of one day at our food pantry in Barry City, which is the largest food shelf in central Vermont. And where, by the way, uh, the numbers of people who came to our food shelf in November of 2023 had increased 43% since that same time last year. So the day after our December flood, which also affected significantly many parts of Barry City, I asked all of our frontline staff to do what we call a wellness check on our customers, especially focused on those who were already flood survivors from July. I'm just gonna read you what I received as an email without any identifying information. Lost vehicle, does not have a car. He did not have insurance on his vehicle, so has not had a vehicle since July. Difficulty breathing due to July flood and mold is bad has respiratory issues now. Staying at the park and ride in Montpelier right now, had an apartment on Main Street in July and flood caused major damage to all their stuff, was not on the lease, has no place to go. The person on the lease was relocated, but not him. Needs camping gear, scared of trees falling on him at this time. His last housing was due in July due to the flood, needs housing, food, and clothes. December, lost $100 of food, was at the Knoll during the flood, no cabin available in winter, homeless. Staying at a cousin's on North Main Street in Barria, was not on the lease, never got housing since then, mainly stayed in the woods before then. In the December flood, two and a half to three feet of water inside the buildings, the horse barn and the tack building. Lost my wood, at least $50 worth, from carpentry work that remained to be done to repair damage to July flood. No damage in the, in the house from December. Horse had to move out of the garage. $1,000 worth of shavings lost. Hay is okay. July flood sinkhole on the property that was filled came back after December flood. Needs to have the evacuator back. I'm not gonna keep reading, you get the picture. I hope you will read my testimony because there were 19 entries in one day at our food shelf out of probably 40 people who came in who shared their stories. So, you know, supporting people in poverty isn't new to Capstone's frontline staff, but supporting the ongoing and acute and sometimes overwhelming, both in its complexity and the cost, is like a cascade of needs from a disaster layered on pre-disaster poverty. <clears throat> So I wanted you to know I'm submitting with my testimony some of the information you were asking about. It's information from FEMA, uh, and it documents the number and the demographics of people who have registered for what's called FEMA individual assistance. So I encourage you to peruse the documents to understand the magnitude of this effect and event and its effect on people from what we know from FEMA. And we know that there were 6,300 some odd valid registrants. We know many, but we don't know how many were not considered valid. valid. We know that about 37% of these are in central Vermont. That includes Lamoille and Washington County. About 18%, 1,114, are either low, very low, or extremely low income Vermonters. So nearly 20% of these folks are probably surviving under the conditions I've kind of laid out to you. But what we don't know, we don't know what the state of their recovery is, nor do we know about the people who did not register with FEMA, although we know there are many of those. We know that Vermonters are still suffering from extreme conditions. Many are either displaced entirely or living in substandard or even unsafe conditions. They live in mold, they live in cold, and they live without everything they had before this disaster. They live with the ongoing trauma of the flood and a sense of hopelessness and despair. Thankfully, there are dozens and dozens of volunteers across our state who are still 
valiantly working to help with recovery needs. Uh, there are 10 so-called uh, community-based recovery group organizations that FEMA calls long-term recovery groups, and they've formed throughout the state. I've provided also in my testimony a map of uh, how that state, how those uh, groups are, are set up across the state. Um, and Capstone is, you know, as we just said, working with our case managers to help support in some way uh, those long-term recovery groups. But I recently spent time with volunteers in Barrie City. Uh, the long-term recovery group is called Barrie Up. And Barrie City, I think we can say for <laughs> certain, is the city that has sustained the most significant damage to its housing stock from July. Now, this group estimates that the flood impacted 370 structures, which totaled 528 housing units. So that's the total impact. And roughly speaking, this group estimates that about a third of these sustained relatively minor damage. This also includes businesses. Um, but the, about a third have uh, sort of recovered. A third are in limbo, but a third, they think, are either totally destroyed uh, or damaged. And the city has recently begun to notify uh, some 85 property owners that their property damage has reached a threshold of, quote, substantial damage, for which um, it's complex. And I'm sure the regional planners can explain this better, but rebuilding has to meet a much higher floodplain management requirements. And these substantial damage, damage claims really have laid yet another layer of confusion and uncertainty. You know, these organized, these organizers in Barry Up work tirelessly and they are tired, but they really talk about the emotional toll that um, this event has created. And you've heard um, about that. They talk about their neighbors being frozen, both without adequate heat and or the ability to make decisions without resources to address their acute needs. I'm broken they quoted a resident as sharing. You cannot provide me the resources to replace all that has been lost. And it, I have to underscore that this flood disaster has come amidst an already existing mental health crisis and a housing emergency, both of which have exacerbated the impossible situation of safely relocating folks who have been impacted in the city of Barrie and beyond. But just in the city of Barrie, before the floods, there have been 350 unhoused people living in area hotels, 85 in non-congregate shelters, and about 60 living outside or in cars. So that was pre-flood. You heard over 500 units impacted. Um, there's so much more I could share. Um, that is discouraging. And I'm gonna cut to the chase. I do wanna say that the schools um, are seeing so much. I talked to a community resource liaison in Barrie who said that 110 homeless students um, in the supervisory union and 200 students living in homes with some flood damage. Truancy levels are up. Families are beyond stretched. I do wanna say that as brutal as the current challenges faced by Barry City are, the community is also really inspiring in its determination to support a strong recovery. It was inspiring to be a part of how watching people come together, but also how those who have the capacity are still leaning into what is the future. But we have to realize, and you heard this from Ben and others, I'm sure, that these folks, these communities, our state needs your attention and help because FEMA will not fix the problems. Neither that preceded the flood, nor will they provide local communities with the kind of capacity and resources they need to do the hard work of community rebuilding. You've probably heard about the North End in Barrie, which is where the most extreme impact from this flood has occurred and very much still visible, um, the sense of dislocation and de despair. You know, this is 
um, also an area that experienced extreme devastation in May of 2011, preceding Irene. But this is also where the most creative ideas are coming and are needed for resilient rebuild. A bold idea has been put forward by the Scott administration for thinking differently about redeveloping this neighborhood. It was presented to the city, and now the city is organizing meetings to hear from the neighbors. Uh, because really, what is needed is a concept that I think we really need to focus on of buying out the properties most at risk. But these people who may appreciate in this moment a buyout need a place to move so that the impossible decision of leaving their home can be complemented with a hopeful future. So what might a resilient recovery look like? I mean, I just want to say the outpouring of volunteers throughout the state for months and the extraordinary organizing efforts still being undertaken by neighbors helps me know that in spite of this darkness, there is light. Vermont is always a leading light. I know we can continue to be so as we rebuild from this disaster and prepare for the next. In the short term, we need to think about how investment decisions that we make today will affect the realities tomorrow. We have to support communities like Barrie who have been disproportionately affected by floods and have lived on this razor's edge of economic instability just before this flood. We need to know that all recovery is local. FEMA is not gonna solve our problems. You gotta think about FEMA as an insurance company. They replace what is lost only if it's eligible, but they do not restore. They do not invest in community building and they do not invest in resilience. Their processes are very complex and sometimes, as you've heard, take a very long time. The home buyout program is a critical example. Buying homeowners out of their current home is a hugely important strategy, both in the short and long term, because it will protect that flood drain, which will then support greater resilience for where people move. But FEMA takes years, sometimes decades. I heard that a town in southern Vermont, I think Londonderry, just closed like two weeks ago on their Irene uh, buyout. And of course, home and homeowners need to make their decisions right now. So I recommend that the state expedite this process by using state funds to advance payments for investments that can be recouped by FEMA later. It's much like what is being proposed for paying towns for rebuilding their roads now so that FEMA can repay them through the public assistance program. This could be, um, this could be implemented through the municipal bond bank, perhaps VHFA, VITA, our credit union, financial institutions, but we need upfront cash because homeowners cannot wait a year or 10 years to find and move out of their homes. Looking ahead to the longer term, we also need to focus on what I call preparedness, and particularly for the most at-risk folks that I've been talking about. Those who are most economically vulnerable are often also living in high hazard areas. So we need to take stock of the lessons learned of how we've been supporting three people through this disaster and be better prepared for sheltering, feeding, and transporting people in a disaster. We now have the ability, the tools to forecast the kind of needs people will have and help resource local nonprofits like ours and many other ahead of the next disaster, not expect them to provide essential needs without resources nor the authority to, do, to act. So we need to be ready to utilize this dislocation as a time of thinking differently about where and how we rebuild. Communities need leadership and they need vision and they need hope that there is a brighter future ahead. One that can be safe from impending climate disasters and one they and their children can believe in. And I wanna thank you for providing that hope and thank you for being the light. Thank you very much.
Thank you for your testimony and um, you and your uh, organization's incredible hard work and response in supporting Vermonters. Do members have questions? Uh, right, Representative Dodge. I uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was curious whether language access was a, was a, a major obstacle for delivering these services. Absolutely, in some areas. I mean, we have learned uh, one of the many things we do is run a Head Start, and we have families uh, with multiple languages, and we use um, our our cell phones have special language access, but completely uh, a problem, especially uh, that's right in disaster. But um, FEMA does a decent job of trying to translate uh, some of their materials. But as you may understand, the process of applying for FEMA and working through, for example, if you're denied FEMA assistance and you need to appeal, you must go through the SBA. These processes are very complex to navigate and they need more folks who have dual language or multiple language access. So it is an issue that we need to think much more about as we move into the future. Thanks for raising it. Chair Coffey. Great. Thank you so much, Sue, for joining us today. Um, I know this is a not an ideal setup, so I don't know if you can see us very well, but um, thanks so much and for your work. Um, and just to note, I don't think we have your written testimony, so I don't think it's on our web page. So I, and I think a lot of us would benefit from that. Um, sorry, it's on there on the other committees. Oh, okay, it needs but to not ours. on the transportation committee's web page too. So maybe Jeannie, you can do that. But um, my question is more this: I he I hear you loud and clear. I think um, transportation is really a key barrier for many people, um, not just in an emergency, but participating in community life, getting to doctor's appointments. You know, you name it. Um, and I'm just really, you know, you're the project that you helped launch, you know, community rides, filling that gap. Can you just tell us a little bit more about it? And you know, we're going to be considering this session. Our committee is going to be really looking at public transit and especially in servicing rural communities. Um, but, you know, the, how are you continuing to fund that work? Because I know the program got launched through an MTI grant. Um, and I think it's those were really meant as kind of pilot projects, but I would be interested to hear about ongoing operations and how you're now that it's you've you know launched and you know how how you're serving the community and what some of the successes and challenges are. Thank you, Madam Chair, for asking this question. Can you hear me still? Yes. So Community Rides Vermont is a pilot. It's an initiative to sort of, it's a demonstration project of sorts, and it really combines uh, how do we address transportation access and equity for uh, the folks who literally can't afford a car, um, but also how do we transition to uh, the green economy by using all electric vehicles and by providing uh, decent paying jobs for the drivers. We have um, our service um, is about to go public as called Gopher. Uh, if you think of your um, uh, Uber or Lyft, uh, we aspire to be an app-based uh, transportation provider that can provide on demand. We're very much at our first phase. We've launched, we have four drivers and three cars gonna try to buy a fourth car. Our um, funding is very multifaceted, of course. We're trying to mix private sector philanthropy and publicly subsidized rides. So we're taking advantage of existing public transit dollars for elderly and disabled, um, for uh, Medicaid transportation, uh, for transporting children to school, uh, for also a very important initiative that you all um, uh, began called Mobility for All. Those are helping us draw down some pu public dollars to leverage philanthropic dollars that we have been grant raising through grants, through private donors. Um, we would love to get major national donation for this. So we're proving our demonstration. Um, and our goal is to be um, self-sustaining uh, through the various uh, uh, sources that we've talked about. Um, but I think there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to go. Um, 
We're going to look forward to bringing some of our cars um, to you and testifying more about where we're at. We have a general manager. Uh, it is a its own community nonprofit organization, a Capstone, which has previously spun off other nonprofits like the Food Bank, Downstreet Housing, Community Capital. This is now Community Rides Vermont has been launched as its own nonprofit, its own board, uh, and our service is going to be known as Gopher. Go for it. <laughs> That's great. So just the, the state dollars that flow into that are really through the subsidized rides, like Medicaid rides. Uh, yeah. So just want to be clear on um, the committee, um, for our committee. Thank you, Sue. I don't think. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. All right, members, I think that will be the wrap for Friday and, um, and for our joint hearings. But this is great. And look forward to continuing to communicate with the Transportation Committee on our overlapping um, areas of addressing climate resilience. So with that, we are adjourned for the weekend.